The guy we have with us on the line right now, he's a friend, and boy, what a basketball player he was. Uh, first of all, for the Iowa State uh, Cyclones, he was an All-American. He also had a great career in the NBA with the Bulls, the Milwaukee Bucks, and a career in Europe as well. And uh, what better person to talk about than these issues involving race in the NBA? That is Marcus Pfizer joining us right now on the line. Marcus, thanks for coming on. How are you? Hey, what's up, Marcus? Marcus, are you there? Hello. Hey, Marcus, can you hear me? Hey. Hey, no, okay. Thanks, Shut Marcus. Up for a second there. That's okay. Thanks for joining us on the air, Marcus. We appreciate it. So let me Thanks ask me. let me ask you this first question, if I may. You know, there are some athletes out there that are criticizing the NBA players, whether they be former athletes. I want to read you a statement by Brian Urlacher. Uh, I don't know if you saw this. He said, Brett Favre played the Monday night football game the, uh, the day his father died. He threw four touchdowns. NBA players boycott the playoffs because a dude reacting – uh, you know, was was reaching for a knife. What what would you say to somebody like Brian Urlacher who makes a statement like that? Um, I would tell someone like Brian that you know, um, he would expect us to be as outraged as we are if someone, you know, including a cop or anyone else, shot him in the back seven times. Right. No matter what he was reaching for, um, there's there's been allegations of <clears throat> of him reaching for a knife that hadn't been confirmed, or if it has been confirmed, no, no matter which way. You know, you have four or five cops there with their guns drawn. And even if he was reaching for a knife, I think the odds of someone hitting him before he was a threat with that knife was a lot more grand than him being shot in the back seven times. I agree. I agree. Absolutely, 100%. Well, you know, I look at the situation, and I, I think to myself, it, it it was probably bad policing. But how I think the, 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 the conversation that how do you call – this particular officer, who's a seven-year veteran in the Kenosha Police Department, especially after you know J- Jacob Blake was tased, he was not phased by by his tase. The officer was standing very close to him, so if Jacob Blake did have a knife, I mean, I mean at that point he has a deadly weapon. But how do you call that a, a racist act? Well, I'm not necessarily saying that it was a racist act or whatever you want to label it as. The fact of the matter is, we're addressing the fact that yet and still another black man was shot, and not only shot, he was shot in the back seven times. Now, according to the reports, when he was tased, he was tased on the other side of the vehicle before trying to enter his vehicle. Right. Reports are that if there was a knife, there was a knife on the inside of his vehicle that he was going at. Right. And right. again, there was more than one cop with his, with his weapon drawn right. and that was on him. And so if he was going to be a threat with that knife, I'm sure somebody would have taken him down before then. Agreed. He opened up the door, yep. and then it was just straight seven shots to the back. Uh, yep, and, I you know. I'm, yeah. I'm coming from a point of where, you know, uh, our ex-athlete and uh, my older brother spent 20 years in law enforcement. And if my brother, who is black, um, was involved in something like this and he shot somebody in the back seven times, I would say to him, man, what the hell are you doing? Exactly. No, you know? I agree. I, I agree. Mean, it's it's yeah. as simple as that. I agree. So, Marcus, uh, if you were playing in the league right now, I would imagine you would 100 uh, percent agree with what the players are doing. What does it mean to you to show, you know, LeBron James leadership in this situation? Not only that, but how about the NHL and all these other sports deciding, you know, what the NHL decided to do yesterday? It's got to make you feel good. And I would imagine to, to know that there are a lot of people that are on the player's side in the NBA when it comes to this issue. Well, it, well, it's huge. It's huge. The, the, the thing about athletes is everyone feels like athletes, pro athletes, make so much money and so life is grand. You know, you can you can be the two hundred uh, billion, two hundred dollar, uh, two hundred dollar billionaire Jeff Bezos, and right. someone can walk up to you and shoot you in the head, and then now your life is over. Exactly. So it's not about the money. It's about the the quality of life. It's about you know the future. We're we're concerned about our seeds. You know, I have a twenty two year old son that's in Fresno playing basketball, and I have a 16-year-old son that's here in Las Vegas playing basketball as well. And so those are two black young men that I have to worry about, you know, once they go out in the street, whatever is going on. You never know what, what, what the situations are. So we're not thinking about the money aspect of it all. We're thinking about the big picture because here I am. I turned 42 a couple of days ago this month, and 20 years ago I was drafted into the NBA. And 20 years passed so fast. And, you know, now LeBron James, I remember he was 17, 18 years old. Right. Now right. he's 35. Yeah. Time passes so fast, and we're more concerned about the quality of life going forward. What is, the, what is it to have all these riches and have, having the ability to do whatever that you want in life, but once you go out to try to have some kind of normalcy in life, right. you know, you, you're fearful. 
absolutely. If you're just joining us, we're speaking with the former college basketball All-American and a good NBA career as well, Marcus Pfizer. So, Marcus, we uh, got into a debate before you came on, me and my co-host, and 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 mm-hmm. Mike, and I'll let him speak for himself. But my co-host, J.D., said that he believes the main reason why these NBA players are going back to play on Saturday is because the owners threatened to cut their paychecks 30%. And my response to that, I disagreed with it. I said it's because they're getting some demands by these owners. This isn't about the money. So what would you say to my co-host about that? I, I think I think it's I think they're making a lot of uh, grounds, a lot of leeway of, of what's going on. I don't think it necessarily has to do um, with the salaries. I mean, if you don't know much about NBA salaries and when you're getting paid, you know we're in a part of the year where I've gotten most of my salary from the year. If you take <laughs> right. a couple of paychecks right now, it's not going to. You know, if, if I'm making twenty million, I've gotten at least eighteen five of that right. already. So if you take a couple million, it's not going to hurt me as bad as you think. Um, so I don't think it's more so anything that has to do with the salary part. It could have something to do with it, but the the bigger picture is what is at hand and what should be the focus. It could be a little bit of the owners, could be a little bit of the players. I'm not in that circle right now to exactly know what's going on, but moving forward is, is the biggest thing that we should be focusing on. And, Agreed. and again, not the money aspect of it. Uh, couldn't agree with you more. Okay, so so Marcus, like myself, you're very vocal when it comes to the president of the United States. I think he's an awful human being. Uh, and I, I want to play you a little bit of audio. Donald Trump was asked yesterday by a reporter about this NBA boycott. I want you to listen to his response, and then we'll talk about it. Here it is. I don't know much about the NBA protest. I know their ratings have been very bad because I think people are a little tired of the NBA, frankly. Uh, but I don't know too much about the protest. But I know their ratings have been very bad, and that's too... That's unfortunate. They've become like a political organization, and that's not a good thing. I don't think that's a good thing for sports or for the country. So we're talking about racial issues here and police brutality, and he talks about the NBA ratings, Marcus. What do you make of that? Um, I, I knew exactly that clip that you was going to play because I actually heard it live when he said it. Um, um, because, uh, you know, I, I pay attention to what's going on, and you have to pay attention to what's going on with the president of the United States. But that's the thing. That, that's the thing with him. Like, you know, he has such a huge platform, and he only focuses on the things that he feels like there's a direct negative against him. If it has nothing to do with him, it's always negative rating. Always negative rating. Hey, Marcus, He's always talking about rating. Marcus, isn't it a classic shut up and dribble comment that he just made? Because that's how I took it. Uh, uh, you can say, but we're past that whole shut up and dribble, you know, aspect of it all. It, it's just a, it's it's a dog whistle that he blows each and every day to rile up his base and make it feel like it's something that it's not. I mean, how can he prove that the NBA ratings are down? He just said he don't know much about the NBA. Right. So if you don't know much about right. something, it, I mean, it would behoove you to learn more about it before you just fall off the cuff of sand. That's a very, very good point you just made. Let's move on now to Jared Kushner, right, the, the son-in-law to Donald Trump. So Jared Kushner was on CNBC on Wednesday. And he was asked about the NBA strike. Sean, if we could play that clip. This is Jared Kushner now speaking on CNBC. Listen to his reaction to this NBA strike. Look, I think that the NBA players are very fortunate that they have the financial position where they're able to take a night off from work without uh, having to to have uh, the consequences to themselves financially. So they have that luxury, which is great. Jared Kushner, whose father is a gazillionaire uh, billionaire, who paid $5 million so his son could go to Harvard, and now you have Jared Kushner really talking about NBA players and how much money they have and what a luxury it is that they could take a day off. I mean, what do you make of that? Well, I mean, it's just the same. You know, he's been taught, he's been taught extremely well, you know, the points and the buttons to hit uh, and to push, you know, to rile up the base. You know, yes, we are extremely fortunate. Yes, it is a blessing uh, to be able to um, have this talent and be able to get paid for it. I will, I will hope that everybody in life has the ability to, you know, get paid for the thing that they're passionate about. But that's not our fault. You know, that's not the player's fault that they're able to, you know, afford to take a, a day off. I'm sure that if he, if he chose to take a day off or a month off or, or you know, chose to go uh, overseas somewhere, you know, he would be fine financially as well. I, I agree with you. Let's talk a little bit the Black Lives Matter movement. I am one of those people that supports the Black Lives Matter movement. I've been to some of the protests in Las Vegas. I think the majority of those that are in this movement are good people. They want equality. This is about police brutality. 
What would you say to many, many of them are Republicans out there that always bring up, well, how come they don't talk about black on black crime? How come they're not talking about, you know, Dorn? How come they're not talking about this? How come they're not talking? What do you what do you make of that when people always make the argument that they're a Marxist group? And and why is LeBron James not talking about black on black crime? What, what do you say to those people? I mean, the same reason why, you know, we don't talk about white on white crime. We're, we're not focusing on, you know, the aspect of crime. We're, we're focusing on the aspect of um, police injustice. And, you know, every time you turn around, it seems like there's another, you know, African-American that's being murdered or killed. It, it, it doesn't matter what race you are. We're talking about anybody that's in a situation where their lives are taken unjustly. Agree. I want to. I want to talk a little bit. Go ahead, JD. You had a question. Yeah. One. One of uh, mine, and I think that I that I speak for quite a few people, and I am Caucasian. But when, when LeBron James you know, talks about Ahmad Arbery with what happened with him and how he believes that black people are hunted and black people are terrified every single day, like you said after the Jacob Blake shooting. But but the NBA has this major deal with China and what's going on in China right now with the Uyghurs. I mean, they 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 literally have concentration camps and they're they're trying to to take this these Muslim people out of their country. But LeBron James and other athletes they they refuse to mention that. So it's People like myself, it makes him and those other athletes look like hip, you know, hypocrites. Well, uh, I, I get what you're saying, but Ahmad was hunted. And until the nation realizes as a whole that he was hunted, we're not going to move forward. We're not going to just you know, continuously say this person says that or that person says that. It was an act that was recorded and it was seen. It was hunted. So once we get to that point, then we may maybe we can address something else that's going on in a different country. Where there's there's all kind of different treaties and all kind of different um, partnerships going on with all kind of different countries that we know are are probably not the best. You know, I guess you were saying humanitarian wise, but why every time that something like this happens, we have to go to the next one and say this and say that. Right. Why, why we can't address the point that's going on right now and then try to move move to the next step? Agree, and, and there's no – make no mistake about it. He was lynched. That's what it was. That was a lynching. Uh, there's no, and, and, Brian, we talked about that ad nauseum. I'm not denying that. But, but when LeBron James says that every single African American – every single black person is you know is hunted when they leave their home, that's something totally well, different. Let's talk to Marcus about Especially that. Especially with how large his platform let's, is and how, and how many young African American or, or – you know, black people I look understand. up to him let's and what talk, he says. Let's talk to Marcus about that. Marcus, I haven't always agreed with everything LeBron James said, uh, but I Correct. do I do believe he has a good heart, and I think he's doing this for the right reasons. Do you think maybe he could have chose his words a little differently? Have you felt that way? Do your kids feel that way, that every time um, they leave the house, they feel like they could be hunted? No, I, and, and if you guys say LeBron said that, I, I don't think I've read that. I don't think I've heard that, but I will actually look it up. But, yeah, he did say um, that. I don't. I don't, I don't personally feel that way. And like you just said, you know, you're Caucasian and, you know, the, my father's side of the family is Caucasian as well. So I don't come from a place where I'm just a, a sole 100% black man that's speaking of the fact that, you know, oh, pro-black, pro-black, pro-black. No, I'm, I'm a human being right. that's pro-white. It doesn't matter what race you are. Right. You know, if, if I see a white person being chased down by a white cop, being shot in the back by a white cop. Yeah. I'm going to say, say and feel the exact same way that I feel now. And, and that's exactly how I feel too, Marcus. And I can speak for the fact that you are you are 100% being honest there. I want to talk to you about a moment that I think was a very poignant moment in the last several days. Marcus, I'm sure you've heard about this 17-year-old named Kyle Rittenhouse who was at the, mm-hmm. one of the Black Lives Matter protests in Wisconsin. He kills mm-hmm. two protesters. And after he kills two protesters, he's walking towards police with his hands mm-hmm. up. All the police... Police drive past him. He's not arrested. And I say to myself, and many black people in this country are saying the same thing, what would have happened if Kyle Rittenhouse was black? Do you think that would have gone down the same way? And that's the issue that we're facing right now in this country. Am I wrong? And that's the, that's the huge issue. You know, he's a 17-year-old individual who can't even vote. And my 16-year-old, 17-year-old son leaves the house going to the store Without a weapon, I'm asking you, where are you going? And now reports have come out that his mom actually drove him right. across state lines from Illinois to Wisconsin with a gun and apparently drove him back after everything taking place. That's the issue that we're dealing with. What are we building here? Are we building a country full of kids that looks towards a certain demographic of what I want to be in life? I mean, they, they totally have the safeness of everything that is going to be okay. We can do this. I, I mean, I, as a 42-year-old 
grown men have never walked down the street with a long rifle around my shoulder and felt comfortable. I, I live in a state right now where it's an open carry state, and me and my wife both have weapons that we open, openly carry, carry, and I'm more nervous than that kid was at 17 years old. Now, I will say this as far as Kyle Rittenhouse. After that took place, he in the video, he was walking down the street with his arms up in the air. He made, he, he, he made it pretty clear to police officers that whatever they were going to do, they were going to do. He, he made no effort to to resist or not comply. But, J.D., you're with, with an, No, I'm not, we're not. How, how am I missing you're, the point? We're not. Okay. Well, me, I mean, hold on. Let me, the, let me like, answer like, that. Like, no, this, the, not, the situation, the the situation with, with, with Jacob Blake, for example, that, that was clear resistance. With Kyle Rittenhouse, had Kyle Rittenhouse resisted about, police and, and had he JD. been in touch with police and, and had he done something to, to try to attack police? Police, okay, and, and, and had he lived, I would understand that argument. Not, but in this case, Kyle JD, Rittenhouse was walking okay. down that road Ma- with his arms up in the air. Yes, Marcus. he had a weapon, but but he made himself very okay. clear that he was going to not resist any where, any type of police direction. Marcus, where, I don't want, where, did, where did Jacob Blake attack the police? Uh, he was he was brawling with them on the ground before before he got taken. Allegedly, no, I'm, allegedly, uh, we we had like we we had like the caller, uh, Rayshon White, called in who actually took that okay. video and and he described that as well. Okay, so so he was wrestling with police. Four or five cops were wielding weapons, and he was more of a threat than a kid walking down the street with a long weapon? That's a good point. Can I just say something else real quickly, Marcus, and I don't want to speak for you. J.D., we're not necessarily talking about Rittenhouse at that moment. Well, you what brought, I, you on, brought up me, Rittenhouse, you gotta, and you said, well, you he's still alive, and he, did, he didn't get shot please or attacked. Let, please let me finish my statement. We're not talking about necessarily at that moment Rittenhouse's behavior we're talking about the fact that police drove past that individual with his hands up didn't make an arrest and then he was able to drive home they didn't make an arrest and what I speak and what Marcus I think what you're speaking of what would have happened if that was a black individual walking down the street with an AR-15 or whatever gun he had do you think it would have gone the same way Marcus you get what I'm saying right Uh, absolutely not not and and to take it one step further after all of that occurred him nor his mom went to the police station and turned the, themselves in. We're talking about the double standard, right? We're talking about, you know, people shouting, he just shot someone, arrest him. He just shot someone. And nobody arrests this kid. And all we're trying to say is if, if Rittenhouse was a black kid, I don't think that would have gone down the same way. That is what this movement is about. It's about they want to be treated as equals, right, Marcus? That's what this movement's about. That's all it's about. Yeah, I mean, there's no question about that. So, Marcus, what would you say to people out there that are calling the Black Lives Matter movement a Marxist organization? They're saying that, well, you know what? There's not systemic. Now, I believe there is systemic racism in society. Mm -hmm. Can you talk? I mean, talk about the way you grew up, right? You grew up in Detroit, if I'm not mistaken, right? Can you can you talk to me? about what it was like for you growing up and dealing with maybe some of the stuff you had to deal with in life when it comes to systemic racism? Well, I was speaking to a, to a friend um, a couple of days ago, and I, and me, growing up, you know, six, eight, uh, a bigger man, a bigger individual, I don't think I've ever really been approached now. I'm not going to say that it's ever been, it hasn't ever been said or situation has, has never occurred, but i I'm not an individual that many people will say things to them to their face that to my face that's offensive, and they think they will get away with it. Right. So I never really dealt with with it head on like that. But I know tons of people who have, and and it's extremely hard. Growing up as kids, you don't know what reasoning is happening. You just know, you know, your parents telling you to don't do and don't go, and you just try to stay away from it because ultimately we just want to grow, we want to live, we want to have some kind of successful life. And, you know, live, live long, you know, right. and what we're seeing now, it seems like that's that's being cut off at every, you know, every angle, every corner that we look up. Can you tell me, Marcus, what it's been like as a black man living in this country, raising kids, the conversations you've had with those kids? Can you talk to me a little it, bit about law enforcement and those types of difficult conversations you've had to have? It's extremely, it's extremely scary and it's extremely difficult because here I am as an adult, as a parent. You know, not understanding and trying to teach my kids something that I don't even understand. That's 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 the scary part of it all. Like you have to try to be a parent. You have to try to give them some sense of comfort, some sense of safety when you don't even get it. You know, right. our kids can't understand why the probably one of the most the most popular presidents ever 
cannot unite the country. You're I mean, absolutely right. even with yeah. the whole rally that he had last night or the acceptance speech and all of that stuff, you cannot mention one time. You talk about Kenosha, but you cannot say Jacob Blake's name. You're the president of the United States. Mm-hmm. You're not the president of the white states or the black states or the Hispanics that you claim that came over illegally. You're the president of the United States. You have to be better than that. That's a great point. I will ask you this, Marcus, if you had a chance to sit down with the president of the United States face-to-face without any cameras there, what would you say to him? I will ask him what's really good. Like, like seriously, in all honesty, what's really good with you? Because this is the United States. This is the same country that we all came up in. Do you not see the division? There's never been in the history the amount of division in this world, mm-hmm. in this country, than it is right now. And, and in, the, in the midst of a pandemic, we're not even thinking about the pandemic anymore. Yeah. We're not even thinking about that anymore. We, I've had three or four confirmed cases of the coronavirus in my house that we've passed, thank God, and we're not even focused on that no more. We're focused on, you know, individuals being shot in the back, and we're focused on blaming the Democrats versus the Republicans. There's no middle ground anymore. Is that, I, I, it, it, it's either you're going to be this way or you're going to be that way. And it's it sucks to be an American right now. Everybody is laughing at us. Mm-hmm. I got friends that I play with overseas and stuff, and they said, man, we used to be, we used to want to be like y'all so much now. Now y'all can't even visit our country. Yeah, Everybody wow. wanted to go to the United States. Yeah. Now you can't even come here. That is so powerful, you just said, because you had a long career in Europe playing professional basketball as well. And you, and you mentioned the coronavirus. I mean, it hasn't been mentioned very much in the Republican National Convention. You're, you're absolutely right about that as well. I want to talk to you quickly before we let you go, Marcus. I would imagine, and I'm, I'm making an assumption here, uh, that you'll be mm-hmm. voting for Joe Biden. I, I would assume that. Uh, with that being said, what did it mean to you for him to pick Kamala Harris as his vice president nominee? I mean, it, it meant a lot, of course. Um, you know, for for an African American, and they try to, you know, that that right now. Um, just just like the previous president was African American, but not to the fact of just an African American, just some kind of change. The first woman. You know, it, we need to be moving towards a direction of making it better, making us right. better, and not just saying that we're doing that. Because again, I thought. This, this president that, that's here now will come in and completely change his No, Did I vote for him? Absolutely not. That's, that, that's not. that's not a secret. But with the popularity and, and everything that he has, he, he had so much to make this country so much different than it is now. I totally feel like he would have been the first president that, you know, would have been so popular to stop it from being just a two-term <laughs> with, right. with all of his backing and everything that he had, he's that popular. But when you've taken us down the road that we're at now, you're starting to make a lot of people, you know, sit and think and wonder because they always say this and they always say that. I got family back in Iowa that are farmers that absolutely voted for him that will absolutely not vote for him now. And all you hear is, you know, so many people support him and a farmer's love. No, they don't. Because everything, all of these promises made and promises kept is nowhere close. Marcus, I couldn't agree with you more, my friend. You're always a class act and, and well said, my friend. I appreciate it. I'm glad your family's doing okay. I didn't even know you guys had, uh, some of you had the virus. I'm glad you guys are, are doing all right. Now, thank you so much, as always, for always taking the time to come on this show. Uh, these are impor- no problem. These are important conversations that people need to hear, especially from somebody like you. Marcus Pfizer, thank you so much, my friend. We'll talk to you soon, okay? Thanks a lot, Marcus. Take care. All right. Thank you. Marcus Pfizer, I love talking to him about politics, race relations. Not only was he a phenomenal basketball player, he was actually an All-American. My friend coached him. Larry Eustace, she coached him at uh, Iowa State. Boy, was that a great basketball team.